All right, welcome everyone to tonight's event. We are really excited to have Hibikoza here with us tonight. Um, I'm here, uh, my name is Vivian Zavataro. I'm the director of the Orich Museum of Art. Uh, but I'm here tonight to introduce uh, you to Rodney Miller. He, it, he was our interim director uh, last year, right before I came, and he, he done so many amazing things in his tenure as interim, but also in his tenure as the Dean of the College of Fine Arts. And he's retiring in four days? One week and one day, and uh, eight hours and 23 seconds. <laughs> he will be missed by all of us. He's been so welcoming and wonderful to me. Uh, so selfishly, I, I'm going to miss him a lot, just seeing him around. But uh, he's not going anywhere. <laughs> he's he's going to be here in Wichita, so we can go hug him every once in a while. But please well, help me welcome Rodney Miller. Good evening, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, wonderful uh, occasion. Uh, I am Rodney Miller, and uh, it has been my honor for the last 19 years to be the Dean of the College of Fine Arts, and it's my honor to give this introduction today. Since I had the honor to be, <clears throat> to serve as the interim director of the Ulrich last year, um, when this sculpture, Stratosphere, by Hibikoza was commissioned and created. This project obviously is very close to my heart uh, as I prepare, and as I said, exactly one week and one day to retire from uh, Wichita State after 19 years of service. I am so pleased to know that the campus I leave behind will have this inspiring piece of art on it to welcome future students, faculty, staff, and visitors. During the construction of Woolsey Hall, the beautiful home of the Barton School of Business in which we find ourselves today, the Elrich Museum developed a very productive partnership with the group of leaders who spearheaded this project. They included Dr. Larissa Jenin, Dean of the Barton School of Business, Dr. Elizabeth King, CEO of the WSU Foundation and Alumni Engagement, and Emily Patterson, Executive Director of Facilities Planning. I'd also like to recognize President Rick Muma for encouraging this partnership and helping foster it as part of his vision for what Woolsey Hall would be. All of us working at the Ulrich in spring of 2022 were thrilled when we were approached by the group designing Woolsey Hall with the proposal for another outdoor sculpture near this building, in addition to the pieces by Deborah Butterfield and Hank Willis Thomas that had already been acquired for this purpose. Notably, this group had the foresight not only to add art into the plan for Woolsey Hall from the start, but were also open to working with the Ulrich staff to find cutting edge contemporary work that would be a great addition to the campus as a whole and add to the now 86-piece strong Martin Bush outdoor sculpture collection. As a result of this openness, Stratosphere was commissioned to be a unique work of art whose particular shape, imagery, and even production process speak to the aspirations of the Barton School and WSU, as I'm sure you'll hear more about from the artists. A few words of introduction about them. Hibikozo stands for the Hyperspace Bypass Construction Zone and consists of two artists, Serge Beaulieu and Yelena Filipchuk. As these artists put it themselves, quote, our, work celebrate, our works celebrate the inherent beauty of geometric form and pattern and compose them in ways that harmonize the experience of sculpture, light, and shadow, end quote. Both Serge and Yelena came to art making from other professional interests and bring a unique combination of skill sets to their work. Yelena studied conservation and resource studies at UC Berkeley, concentrating on patterns in the natural world, biomimicry, and environmental justice. 
before later training in studio art and fabrication and uh, digital design. Serge trained and, pract and practiced uh, and practiced as an industrial designer for a decade before returning to his roots as an artist and sculptor. Perhaps because their paths to art have been less traditional, their work, which exists in both permanent and temporary versions, has found its way to a really broad array of public venues and locations. It was first installed at Burning Man in the Nevada desert and has since then cre been created for the U.S. Embassy in Turkey, multiple government buildings and corporate headquarters in California, and the Dubai Mall in the United Arab Emirates. I'm very excited to hear from Serge and Yelena momentarily about their inspirations, ideas, and process. Before I pass the, the uh, torch to them, however, I would lastly like to acknowledge the dedicated work of the folks without whom the complicated logistics of this project would not have come together. Curator Ksenia Gerstein, Registrar Joe Reinert, Preparator James Porter and business manager Joanna Ramondetta at the Ulrich were all instrumental to the research that went into this commission and the follow through on project planning. The Ulrich Advisory Board and the WSU Foundation Board both gave the necessary approval for the project. Todd Wolsencroft, Eason Breyer, and their team at facilities planning were instrumental both literally and figuratively, in planning, site preparation, and installation. Finally, Elliot Shuffle from the Hibikozo team led the installation to a swift and successful completion. I'm grateful for the work of all these people. It was my pleasure to work with them while supporting Serge and Yelena's creative vision. And now, without further ado, Hibikozo. Oh, you have mics. Yeah. Thank you, Rodney. Yeah, thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was um, very thorough. So <laughs> it seems like you guys have done your research. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for making it. Um, and thank you so much to the Ulrich and to um, Wichita State for hosting us. It's really a wonderful experience to both have worked with the staff here as well as um, been given the creative freedom to create this sculpture for a site-specific purpose um, and to come here and give this talk. Uh, um, we're just so pleased to be here and to have gotten a tour of the campus. It's just such a wonderful institution and truly like a, an amazing example of an, Amer of an American art institution. Um, so my name is Elena. This is Serge. And like we, um, like Rodney said, our practice has been um, a very interesting path of getting into the creation of public art. Uh, my background was primarily in conservation and research studies and environmental um, science. And, but I was always the person who was looking through the microscope and being like, wow, do you see these building blocks of life here? Aren't they so beautiful? Aren't the structures that make up um, but plant growth and roots and um, and the uh, the f uh, formations of um, even like something like the mycelium of mushrooms isn't it so beautiful isn't the way that we see the world actually informed by these patterns of, in nature and wouldn't we think that the original concept of beauty or proportion comes from these patterns that appear in nature and in 2014 um, Yelena and I got together to create Hibikozo, and it was our first collaboration developing an art installation before. We both had this shared uh, wonder of geometry. We were both digging deep into exploring it and starting to understand it, and we really wanted an outlet to take this shared knowledge we had and generate something um, for the public, for the people, to really showcase what we were learning and going through. Um, before Hibikozo, I think this was the, the breadth of our voca uh, geometric vocabulary. We knew a few different shapes, and like you, uh, could name probably three different polyhedra, right? <laughs> <laughs> Over the time, we started to really understand what is the greater network of, of, of uh, polyhedras of shapes. In the center here, 
you have these, they're called the platonic solids. These are the, the basic shapes you can see here, such as a cube. You know, we, we really had a hard time thinking outside the box, <laughs> but now we're only thinking outside the box. We have uh, an a octahedron, a tetrahedron, a uh, icosahedron, and a decahedron. These are all the platonic solids, and they're made of sides with the same side uh, length and the same angle. And on the outside, there's an Archimedean solids. These are interesting. I'll get into how they're created. But you can see here, stratosphere is based on one of these uh, classes of shapes. And the green is the Catalan solids. And then there's six, seven, eight more rings. It goes on forever. And through our practice, we have learned that it, our artwork is a fractal of itself. The wonderful thing we realize is a lot of these shapes exist in nature. Right? It's not just the patterns that exist in nature, but it's the shapes themselves. So as a pyrite crystal forms perfect cubes, a garnet crystal makes perfect rhombic dodecahedrons. And you can see here, this is a fluorite crystal that's a truncated octahedron, which is actually the shape of the very first artwork we did. Um, again, patterns. We were learning about patterns. It's looking at the sunflower, looking at how uh, hexagons tiled, um, doing some hand drawings to understand some of the, the symbols, the more traditional symbols. But the further we got, the further we understood it goes much deeper. Right? We almost felt like we were uncovering stones and looking underneath every different investigation from the Penrose tiling, which Robert Penrose uh, won a Nobel Prize for recently, to traditional Ukrainian cross-stitching, um, and then 14th century Islamic geometry that is more advanced than much of the geometry that we're creating now. So this really kind of got us worked up, and we really had to sort of combine these two. So the, in 2014, the first artwork we did, we, we took the truncated octahedron, a shape that we both admired, created a six-fold hexagon pattern, and the, this was the result. Um, and so for us, a big part of our practice has been finding the resonance and proportion between a two-dimensional pattern and a three-dimensional shape. And you'll see that that is something that we try to repeat in our artwork often, is that there's often a very simple mathematical proportion, whether it's like one-to-one -one or two-to-one, basically, that um, informs the way that we choose the pattern or develop the pattern for the sculpture, as well as um, kind of giving our practice a set of rules to follow. So um, maybe there's a quote that says, like, you know, if you know your limits, you are free within that. And we have found that um, kind of the more that we limit ourselves to um, kind of these strict rules, the more creative that we can become within that set of rules. So after the first artwork, we started realizing a unique thing about tessellating shapes. So um, because all these shapes were appearing in our artwork. And this was the first thing we realized. If you can take a square and you can tile it perfectly, right? Like checkerboard does this. The same thing with a triangle. A hexagon does this but a pentagon cannot, right? It leaves gaps. So we understood that a lot of the patterns we wanted to create cannot be created on a two-dimensional surface. We wanted to create a pentagon tile that wrapped continuously forever without the gaps, and that was accomplished through applying the pattern to a three-dimensional shape, such as a dodecahedron. So this sort of opened up our eyes to the ability to create tessellations and patterns that go beyond just a two-dimensional surface, and really think about the three-dimensional surface as a new medium for pattern work. We followed our first artwork by this, the series of three together, starting with like pretty basic shapes. These are the beginning, the pl pl platonic solids that I mentioned earlier. And then we started really uh, connecting with the local community and developing artworks that could be shown in public spaces. Um, and this photo is actually from our first public installation, which was at a museum called the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Has anyone been there? Yeah, so it's so great and it's so dynamic and interactive. And, um, you know, previously we had been creating these sculptures as like, you know, a personal project, something to share with our community, an expression of our own personal practice and research. And um, But when we were able to install it in both an educational setting as well as a place where kids go to interact with the physical world, it really opened up our eyes. Like this first interaction of seeing um, a mom and her daughter going around these sculptures and the daughter saying, what is this? And the mom not maybe having the exact vocabulary to say, this is an icosahedron. 
Um, and that, that's totally fine. But what they did, what we saw them do, is they counted the number of sides that the shape has, which was 20. And so for me personally, that was a real breakthrough moment because we saw the way that, it can, that these sculptures can create um, an opportunity for learning and for education. And whether they were impressed with the mathematics behind the sculpture, or whether they were impressed with the light behind the sculpture, or whether they were impressed with um, the patterning in the sculpture, it created kind of a gateway for them to learn something else about it. And that was a really important part of the, of the process for myself um, because we like to say that you know, art can sort of be a gateway to learning mathematics or science and kind of reverse is that for um, kids or adults even who think that they are good at mathematics or business or science, um, but might say, I'm not an artist, I'm not creative. It actually goes the other way because if they feel, if they feel familiar and comfortable with that, they can explore you know, the other avenue of it. So yeah, our, our goal as well was to take these concepts that we saw just in textbooks. We saw them on websites, we saw all these drawings, but it was no one created these shapes in real life, right? So our idea was to take these concepts from, from, from education and really bring them into the world and let people walk around them, right? As opposed to just see them printed in a book. And this is what, where our work led us from here. We were then, uh, a year later, we were invited to the United Arab Emirates to participate in the Sharjah Islamic Arts Festival with artists from around the world who were all doing the same type of work, incorporating geometry, ancient geometry, into future and modern uh, forms of production. Um, and that is maybe where like an avenue towards spirituality in our artwork comes, is because um, the foundation for Islamic geometry um, comes from uh, an approximation to the divine, is that when there's a beautiful proportion of, um, of, sh of shapes that seem to naturally fit together, um, the, the understanding is that that's a way that you can represent the divine without having iconography of um, a religious figure. And to us, it really seemed to be coming true in the way that we felt when we were creating these sculptures is that there seemed to be something that was not necessarily a personal expression, but rather something that was coming through us. And that was just really the first time that I had had an experience like that, is that it really felt like we were um, just stewarding this type of um, information and um, showcasing it to the world rather than it being just a personal creative expression. Mm -hmm. um, the city of San Francisco uh, commissioned us for our first permanent artwork, which, which is our hometown at the time. So in 2016, we placed this piece. It's a 62-sided Ramakasa dodecahedron. And um, this were like this rolls off the tongue, right? <laughs> this really introduced us to public art, right? To have a piece that was permanently installed, it was up for almost two years. To go there every day, it became a centerpiece for the community. People gathered around it. We'd see um, teachers bring their students there to learn about the shapes. People gathered at night, the same way a bonfire attracts people. We were it had that same sort of feeling, and a lot of people mentioned that they just felt at ease around it, right? People who weren't spiritual just felt relaxed. It was calming. Right? It wasn't LEDs with flashing lights. It was just a soothing light that just people could like be with. Right? Very introspective. Um, this is a more recent uh, installation we did at the US Embassy in Ankara. So do you want to talk about this? Sure. So um, we worked with the US um, State Department Art and Embassies program to come up with um, a sculpture for the new US, new US Embassy in Ankara, Turkey. This photo is just from the parking lot of our, our shop. Um, we have, don't have photos from the embassy yet. Because we can't get um, security clearance <laughs> to get photos, which was just an interesting surprise. Um, so this sculpture um, the, is actually the first sculpture that we ever did made out of multiple layers of material. And so you'll see in the very back, there's kind of a, a dark, um, a dark steel that has that more like angular, um, angular pattern. Then on top of it, there's a uh, sort of Roman, um, more circular pattern. On top of that, there's uh, an Islamic geometry. And then on top of that is a typical Turkish, uh, Turkish pottery pattern. And so this was the first time that we kind of used the artwork to combine um, several systems of pattern work that were native to that area. Um, so the back artwork, the, the most, the furthest back 
pattern. It was from the a prehistoric Bronze Age Hattie people that were native to um, the Ankara area. On top of that was um, the Roman pattern, so it had to do with Roman tiling and marble. On top of that was uh, the Islamic pattern that came over from, um, from the Arab conquest of Turkey. And then on top of that was actually a type of um, blue and white porcelain that became very typical of uh, this region um, in Ankara. But the interesting part when learning about that was that it was actually a type of um, porcelain pottery that was developed in China, but all came to Turkey along the Silk Road and um, became very typical for that region. Um, and so we did a lot of research into, um, into the region and into all of the different uh, traditions of pattern work and design um, that were that came into that region and to show that you know history has this very deep deep understanding of what um, each culture's typical pattern work and how that comes out in its craft this is a, a part of our exhibit in UAE then we started doing pieces that were a little smaller and we played with light differently. This incorporates um, the Ukrainian cross-stitching pattern um, that we mentioned earlier. So we incorporated something more personal, as Elena is from the Ukraine. Um, and this is from the Renwick Gallery um, at the Smithsonian where we exhibited. Um, a recent exhibit in London where we actually started combining compound shapes, right? Rather than singular forms, which I call our earlier works almost building blocks where we are now, we're starting to develop shapes with, with more advanced geometries as we go forward. You know, kind of what's next for us you know, we, we're really getting to 3D patterns. So rather than just two-dimensional patterns, can we do pattern work within three-dimensional shapes? And there's some really interesting studies that, that we've done about how different um, polyhedras tile through 3D space. And here's some examples that we've done. Uh, the one on the left is San Francisco. It's a piece we're doing in San Francisco. The one in the center is actually our next up upcoming piece that we'll be uh, exhibiting at Crystal Bridges this fall in September. So that's really exciting. And on the right is a piece we're doing for Pasadena. Um, California uh, to 2024, but it's about uh, these polyhedras and how they nest together and the relationship between um, multiple shapes of the same and similar geometries. We, it, you know, our artwork has three dimensions, length, width, height, the, the world we all live in, but we like to consider some additional dimensions when we create our artwork. The, them being light, right? Light creates a whole other dimension. Motion and movement is something that, that we strive for, interactivity, as well as immersion. And this is how we, you know, our name, Hyperspace Bypass Construction Zone, is about the study of dimensions beyond the three dimensions we live in. Um, so this helps us sort of get there by incorporating um, light, motion, interactivity. It's often where we create spaces for people to perform and come together, um, and immersion. So pieces that you can go inside of. So rather than viewing the artwork from the outside, you're viewing it from the inside. That flips the script. Um, and the piece, although you can't go inside the piece, the stratosphere piece, if you get close enough, put your face close to it, you can see inside of it. So you can get this experience, this sort of immersive experience, without the needing to go inside. Um, so to highlight um, those previous dimensions that we talked about, Something that I kind of want to tip my hat to is really that we got our start doing art at the Burning Man Festival in Nevada, um, which is, you know, it's like a, I would say it's the world's best place for outdoor sculpture because you can get super duper far away, the light changes, and there's no gatekeepers to doing art there. Um, it's, it's definitely a place where the, you, you're encouraged to touch the art, to interact with the art. Um, it gets that, extremely dark there. So light art definitely has a um, glows. Yeah, um, and you know, like as a child, I just remember being a little put off when I went to art museums and I couldn't touch it. And of course, I understand the reasons for that. But I always wanted to, like, you know, when there's like a thick layer of oil paint, I always wanted to really like <laughs> see it and just, you know, I'm a very a very tactile person. And so, um, when we had the opportunity to start creating art. There, it really opened up our eyes to what um, to what artwork can be, and so yeah, the use of light because it's dark there was almost like a a, a, um, a necessity, right? And so um, necessity is the mother of invention, right? And then um, for motion, like you want 
to have some sort of aspect that people can interact with and have there be um, like a fourth dimension to it, which is time, right? So having people be able to move or interact with the piece. And the first time that we ever did um, moving pieces, right next to some static pieces, it was almost like the static pieces disappeared and only the ones in motion became important. And I think that that is an essential element of what we um, want to create, which is the experience of time. So whether it be light moving across the artwork um, and changing the shadows around it, or whether you become an active participant and um, are able to affect the light or the shadows that are, com are coming off of the sculpture, that became a very important part of the work. Interactivity is really important, and that's something that um, Burning Man really emphasizes is to have people be able to affect the art or have it become, um, have the people become a part of the artwork as well. So some of these sculptures that we've done where people have used them as performance spaces, they actually wound up having interesting acoustic properties as well, um, which was really interesting. And then the immersion aspect of it, it really changes if you, the artworks really change if you are surrounded by the patterns. It has almost, a, I would say, like a religious effect on you because you're totally immersed in this environment where your eyes are just, just absolutely full of this pattern work and design. Um, the, you know, the use of color within our sculptures too, when people are inside of it, they say that the feeling of being surrounded by a color um, also was really important to them. As, as Elena mentioned earlier, we're, we really consider ourselves stewards of geometry. We're here to showcase these shapes that you know not everyone's aware of, the different classes of polyhedra, the different type of pattern work. You know, we're kind of just downloading it and showcasing it in places we can. And, and this, people have been doing this for thousands of years. You know, Leonardo da Vinci, these are some of his early sketches. Wenzel Jamnitzer did this whole book of, of sketches of different polyhedra investigations in the 15th century. Um, Tony Smith, one of our favorite artists, who's been creating the artworks that study different uh, octahedral uh, forms. Noguchi, of course, who uses geometry in his work, what, including playgrounds. You know, we're going to be next to a playscape at Crystal Bridges we're really excited about. Um, and of course, Buckminster Fuller, who did the same thing, just uh, discovered, researched geometry, and then shared it with the world as almost as an open source. So. We are, are honored. Um, a few years ago, we uh, some authors who did uh, either wrote. worked on books about Bookminster Fuller or had some sort of interactions with him. We um, started receiving this all this mail, um, and people sent us either um, like letters that Buckminster Fuller had written to them, or like a, a book that they had signed, or books that they had written about Buckminster Fuller. And so when we started getting these in like twenty. 15, 2016, right at the beginning of our practice, we would like break out in tears, honestly, every time someone sent us something like this. And uh, another thing like that, that we've done or received is letters or messages from artists who see our art and inspires them to create art, right? Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to encourage creativity in, in others. No one owns geometry, right? There's an infinite number of polyhedras to investigate. So we're doing our, our, our work to understand them, and other artists are doing it as well. And it's really wonderful that people sent the picture, and they made a dodecahedron out of cardboard um, after seeing one of our art installations um, in their city. So I guess we'll get into the stratosphere, the piece that we created, specifically um, um, for the campus here. So getting into the shape, right? it has the, the three-dimensional form um, and the two-dimensional pattern. But I'll kind of get into how the shape was created. So we started with a dodecahedron, OK? Uh, each of these pentagons, we can sort of stellate out and build a pyramid off them. So you can see here right, how this shape transforms to this shape. Then each of these 12 sides, we rotate 36 degrees. We get this. This is the shape that the sculpture is based on. Um, and the dodecahedron is part of the class of polyhedra called platonic solids because they were documented by Plato way back in ancient Greece. And each of the platonic solids had an element that it was associated to, but the dodecahedron was associated to ether. So it was like the highest, most kind of mysterious one and was really the element that drove creativity. It was the last platonic solid that was discovered, actually. Um, so again, you see the stratosphere here. 
And then you see the similarities. You see a hexagon that I'm outlining, and the hexagon here. Well, this is a truncated icosahedron, which is also called a buckyball, after Buckminster Fuller, which you might recognize as a common way to create a soccer ball. Right? And the soccer ball, or the truncated icosahedron, is really interesting, because if you take these pentagons again here, and you build them out, or rather extend the faces of the hexagons a little further to a point, you get an icosahedron, which is another of the platonic solids next to the dodecahedron. So we have this full transformation of a dodecahedron into the stratosphere to an, a truncated icosahedron and back to the icosahedron. Um, and that relationship works because the dodecahedron and the icosahedron are called duals of each other. So if you take the center point of the dodecahedron and you pull it out, it becomes an icosahedron. And if you were to do the same thing with the icosahedron, pull the center out till they become, it becomes planar with the surrounding sides, it becomes a dodecahedron. So a lot of our, the forms we create for our works is a result of this type of investigation. You know, what if I take, what if we take these faces and pull them out, right? We pull them out at an angle that's planar or we pull them out at an angle that is obtuse. And what, what comes of it, right? And you can do this forever. And you can find these really beautiful compositions um, within this regular geometric structure. Another way to break it down is you take the dodecahedron, you trim, you cut off each corner. It's called the truncation. And you just make little triangles here. Well, the triangles get bigger, the deeper you cut, they become a hexagon. Well, here again, here we have the truncated icosahedron, the stratosphere. If you continue further, it makes a icosahedron. So there's a really fun way, um, and this is part of like, we do work lesson plans for some of our geometry we, that teachers can download, that they can actually teach some of this to kids and actually go to our sculptures and actually see it happening in real life. The pattern, um, there's two repeating patterns here, one on the pentagon face, and this hexagon, we actually broken down into three segments into these sort of uh, pentagons as well, but irregular pentagons. And the pattern kind of has three main components. We really want to capture the sun, right? So the pattern emanates from the center, like a sunburst. Okay, we really want to incorporate the wheat grain, which is common with the university, the Shockers logo. Um, and that is a symbol. And then that also references the, the wings, almost so from the aviation industry. So, and these three elements are all related to the sky, right? Whether the sun that's beaming through, you know, the, the industry in the sky or the sun. And that sort of led to the name stratosphere. Um, the star was actually a resultant pattern of the wheat grain tiling around the five sides, um, which we um, kind of by a happy accident, or maybe there are no accidents, um, uh, realized relates directly to the state motto, right, of, of um, Kansas, which is? Uh, my Latin is uh, not so good, and that translates to, which, which we loved very much so, because it really shows that, um, that you know, the, the, the work that it takes to get to a place that's higher. And in generating these patterns, we're able to preview it all digitally, right? Computers are a big part of, of our, our process. We sketch, we sketch by hand, we sketch with paper, we also sketch um, and concept on the computer. So this was a rendering of the inside view, what it would look like if you were able to go inside. But there's a really interesting thing going on where you can see this sort of border pattern making these pentagons, right? And then there's another interlocking pattern that forms the small pentagons and the hexagons. So it's almost like a, a net of two different tessellations going on on top of each other. And this is a photo that I took last night um, looking in. So if you ever wanna, if you know, when you, when you do visit the artwork, please walk up close to it, look inside, kind of push your camera and you can really get a different experience um, on the inside of the artwork. We also, speaking of sketching, I'm gonna cycle through, but these are some different studies that we did on the patterns. So you can see how we can create a pentagon, uh, two pentagon patterns, and the computer can inter uh, populate them and give us a preview of what we're gonna see. This one had like an element of radar you can kind of see in the, um, in the center sections of the hexagon. Um. So part of our process, and we, we will do this for months or, you know, 
and a time, if, if given enough time. As much time as we have. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone asks us how long it takes, and it's usually how much time are we given. Um, the process. So I, I, everyone lo I love sharing how we build this, the sculptures. So the artwork here we broke down into 12 of these pieces. Each of these pieces has six faces. So 72 faces on the artwork. It's actually the most faces we've done on a public artwork before by a few. And so we built out each of these red sections and fabricated them, welded them together, and they were all shipped like this to, to the venue. This is a test build that we did in the studio. So we built them, snapped them together, and then here's the build uh, from the site that James and Elliot assisted with. Lighting is an important part. You've only seen it with white lighting, but the artwork does have the ability to be, have color change lighting. So during special occasions, um, the, the, the team at the, the museum can adjust the lighting. But we have the remote tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can also, when we preview the shadow, right? The shadow is a big part of art. It's not just the artwork itself. It's the, how the impact it makes on the surrounding environment. And we like people to see this and, and think of it, a light being inside of them, right? And their light has an impact on the world around them. So we can preview these patterns as well and how they affect the land, or, or sorry, the ground, the ceiling, or the walls of the environment around them. Um, so now I wanted to talk about you know, how we really got here and how we contextualize our artwork. Um, so Serge and I were both uh, living in the Bay Area and working in technology um, in 2000 through 2014. I, we had both done some creative projects on our own, but really truly were immersed in the work that we were doing, which was in the tech environment. Um, and so um, uh, what we didn't understand is that we were actually immersed in a movement of artwork that actually has its roots in the arts and craft movement, which started in 1880 and to 1920. And it was really about utilizing um, the means of production, like um, industrial processes, like weaving and things like that, um, and taking those things out of the factories and creating craft with them. And it was a really, it was a revivalist movement that started basically in, um, in Britain, came over to the United States, and also separately at that time started in Japan. And it was really about coming back to craftsmanship as a reaction to the hyper-industrialization of that time. Um, so there was economic and social reform that was happening alongside that to create better conditions in industrial environments. Um, and then um, a kind of return to the land movement that started in the 1960s and into the 1970s um, with the whole Earth Catalog and Steve Jobs um, looking at technology as um, potentially a way of liberating ourselves from um, the doldrums of industrial society. And we thought that, um, or they thought at the time that uh, <laughs> that the personal computer, you know, the cell phones we have in our pockets now would eliminate the need for work or for people to be doing work. Um, and in the 2000s, um, that became a reality, right? Everyone got a personal computer. And would you say that you probably work more or less now? <laughs> more, right? <laughs> um, and so that's where we found ourselves as well, is that um, while Serge and I had both kind of studied physical practices in college of you know doing industrial design creating models and i was doing environmental science and studio art and we we're both pretty used to working with our hands by the time that we got into jobs it was all just click 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 um, but what we um what we came to um was an actually a very early access to laser cutters and 3d printers um, and the utilization of CAD for um, creativity. So there was a place called Tech Shop in, the, um, in, um, in San Francisco where we learned to use a laser cutter, like maybe, maybe just like even six months earlier than it was more widely available. Um, and that was an amazing experience because it kind of gave us this head start in, cre in utilizing these tools for, um, for creativity. And um, 
it was an amazing experience. It was an amazing place to work and collaborate. There's a lot of um, classes that we were able to, to take in learning these tools as well as kind of online tutorials about how to use these tools. And it was truly a collaborative creative movement that um, allowed us to get the start. And the, we think that these centers should really be akin to what a public library was or is. You know, I think that every public library should have access to these tools because the unfortunate part about, um, about Tech Shop is that it closed. And the reason why it was not able to sustain itself as a business is because it really is providing a social service. Um, and as soon as you are able to utilize these tools and you become a little bit successful, you wanna purchase one of these tools and set up your own tech shop, set up your own office. And so really the graduation or kind of the, the, the um, metric of success for one of these centers is that someone leaves. And that's not a good business to be in, right? Um, so there's, you know, a lot of talk, and um, you know, uh, Obama opened up um, like a, a study of maker spaces and you know hacker spaces, and it was really supported by the government up until a certain point. And I don't know if there's been kind of like a, you know, a turnaround for, from that. Um, but it really gave us a way to explore the world around us through technology and really apply some of those interests that we were learning, whether it be th you know, through our studies of geometry or through um, you know, my background in biomimicry and um, uh, environmental pattern making. Um, but it really gave us an ability to use those concepts and then turn them into physical reality. And we are just so grateful for that process. Um, and it really was in reaction to kind of the digitization of, um, of our daily lives. And so when we were able to get our hands dirty and start working in the studio, it really gave us a, a reminder that we wanted to be living and functioning in the physical, in the physical world. The, the laser cutter really gave us the ability to create something on the computer and within five minutes hold the physical thing in our hand and then learn from it and do it again. And so it, this process reiterated, iterated, iterated, and allowed us to really generate art at an accelerating pace because we could create and recreate almost overnight. Um, in fact, you could set up, a, you could design something, sculpt something on your computer, send it to a 3D printer, go to sleep and wake up and it would be done. So you could almost do art in your sleep. And, and these tools gave us, uh, allowed us to do this. It was tremendous. Um, but maybe we would have stayed in that um, area of like hobby or craft if we hadn't found our um, passion for public art. And that was really the thing that, um, that did it for us is that we had already had this kind of background in education where there was um, uh, kind of a learn and share sort of movement in the in the maker space and so you learn something you got good at it you shared it with um, in an online tutorial or you shared it with your friends and you were all kind of making art together which I th believe accelerates the process of art as well um, and so we had that education aspect that we really wanted but then when we started seeing it in the public sphere like I shared about the exploratorium that really gave us our, our passion for for the artwork and so we started um, we started creating artworks that were both site specific and then that gave people the opportunity to collaborate with our artwork so this is a dance troupe that choreographed um, <clears throat> uh, like modern a uh, modern dance uh, like performance around our artworks that was extremely beautiful and it's just not a collaboration that I would have anticipated um, but it <clears throat> turned out to be ex so beautiful and so um, participatory also for the community in Scottsdale there. Yeah. I mean, as Elena mentioned, the heart and soul of our practice is public art. Um, it's really the only art we, our, art we do right now is, is to be placed in uh, public places, right? Through either institutions like this, through cities, or through businesses. And we like that um, it really uh, democratizes art. It makes it available to everyone. There's no ticket required. There's no barrier of entry. Anyone can experience it. And that means so much to us for the work that we're doing. Um, it also teaches children and kids and youth that the public sphere is malleable, right? That art is, exists and it's not backed by corporations or a branding agency or a brand activation, that it's malleable and they can be part of this transformation. Um. I, I remember like the, some of the first 
pieces of public art that I saw were actually at a university that my mom was attending when I was um, young and I would wander around the campus and um, they had an industrial arts program and like the main professor had these giant sculptures all over the campus, you know, because where else are you going to put them because they're huge. Um, and I was just, and maybe because I was very small and the art was very big, but it had a real profound effect on me. Um, and, you know, maybe that's why I'm here. And, uh, you know, I really got, got kind of like misty eyed because this is kind of our first installation at our university that, you know, there might be some young child wandering around the campus in like a business school, especially for, you know, um, maybe like older adults that are attending and, you know, do have kids that come to the campus. Um, and having their first ex uh, like experience with public art be at a university, I think is really special because it really made me want to learn more about it. It really, you know, it really transformed my, um, my view of the campus, which was just not just, you know, auditoriums and um, classrooms, but it had a creative aspect to it as well. This image you're seeing here is, is a wonderful story we're really proud of, is the city of West Palm Beach acquired one of our artworks. And it's a very affluent city with parks. And they decided to put this artwork in a sort of a underprivileged community. And the kids, these are the kids, and they came to, to hang out with us as we were building. And like, what's this for? And we're like, it's for you. And they're like, it's for us. And they hung out with us the whole weekend. They were so excited that the city cared about them. They spent the whole, the whole week you know, um, becoming friends with us. And then we did a workshop with them where we had little paper models they could build their own. So this is, this, the, the, it made us feel so good and it, it's gonna really provide these kids with so much as they grow up, remembering that you know, we came, provided this artwork, the city sponsored it, and they have something that, that really brings them together. Um, another thing about public art is we, what's really wonderful is we can create identity for communities. So it'll be site specific. For example, this is a piece that we did in Oakland and we created a, a oak tree, right? And it has a lot of elements that are specific to that neighborhood, including the pattern on the bench, um, which represents the logo for the city and other elements. So it, it really gives uh, the community almost a, something to gather around and to celebrate together. Um, it was just to go back is that Oakland sometimes experiences a lot of protests and especially in this area and um, we used to go out there we did this a couple of times there was a big protest we knew like the target right next door like smashed you know windows. Just smashed windows and all of that and we'd come like you know like with a bucket or maybe like someone graffitied on it or something like that and every single time the sculpture was okay mm -hmm. And that to us really says something about the meaning that it brings to the city is that maybe this gave the protesters, which is, you know, an American, right, um, a, a place to gather, maybe a place to calm down or just a place to, you know, sit or something like that during the protests rather than it being kind of a symbol of, you know, whatever they were protesting. It gave them kind of a, a space outside of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then something else that's super duper important to us is just the concepts of play and education and interaction is that um, we really wanted people to be able to um, uh, interact with the artwork and then get a, a deeper understanding of it as well. And so that um, comes with uh, workshops that we've done um, or surrounding some of the sculptures. We've um, worked with teachers to create lesson plans around the artwork, um, as well as uh, last summer we taught um, a group of teachers that was a, a science teacher paired with an art teacher about how to create cross-curriculum um, educational materials that kind of bridge between uh, science and artwork. This image um, on the right shows this girl. She's actually sketching and drawing not on a flat sheet of paper, but on a three-dimensional icosahedron. So she's been probably something she's never done before, but really seeing how the line can continue all the way around, how you can tessellate a pattern around it. It was really interesting to, to introduce this concept to the kids. And then this is a photo actually from a month ago of, of an installation we had in Milwaukee, where a, a teacher brought her like second grade class to go see the artworks and to learn about the geometry. So we get that often where we're teachers, whether it's math teachers or art teachers, do field trips to the installations. And this sort of like is this, is this 
thing that we realized is that the symbiosis between art and geometry, right, which we like to, to, to be a leader for, but geometry can be a medium for creativity. You can take shapes and patterns and use that for someone who maybe can't sketch or draw. They can literally use shapes to create art. Likewise, um, artwork such as ours might be a gateway to start investigating math and geometry. Right? It really works both ways. So we really like to kind of celebrate this um, interaction between art and geometry and how they kind of feed each other going forward. So thank you guys so much. Um, um, hope you enjoyed it. And there'll be, an there'll be an opportunity for questions. If anyone has a question, um, we'd love to answer. Just raise your hand and the mic will be passed around. Hi, first of all, this is all just really gorgeous. Um, I'm just really curious, and it's probably a simplistic question, but is the golden ratio playing a factor in, in the work that you do? And the golden ratio exists in a Pentagon, right? Um, so yes, it's inherently in there. Um, and there are patterns we use that incorporate the Fibonacci sequence, um, not particularly in this artwork, but in some of our artworks in the past, certainly. Yes, so the golden ratio exists in a Pentagon by taking the ratio of the um, side of the Pentagon um, um, with the diagonal of the furthest line that you can draw within a pentagon. So that always approximates what the golden ratio is. We have done some patterns um, based on the uh, Dal Dahlia pattern, the floral pattern, which has the Fibonacci sequence in it. So any, any pattern um, that exists in nature that we, we've thought is, about is, it. is beautiful. It's <laughs> yeah. inherently, I haven't seen a pattern in nature that's not beautiful. <laughs> And that's just something that um, we love to find these patterns and, and incorporate them into our artwork. Up top. About 15, 20 years ago, I had the great opportunity to go to the Bridges Conference, which used to be held in Southwestern College and now is all over the world. And looking at your art, I feel you must have been to the Bridges Conference. Are you familiar with it? No, oh. tell us about it. Well, it's, it bridges between math and art, math huh. and music, math and science, math and literature. Ah. It's all about math and how they connect with, with other things in the world. But it's really, it's what got me turned on to this whole thing and learned about the platonic solids and mm -hmm. taught things to my elementary students. So just... I just thought for sure you had been there. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah we'll so you might want to check it out. It really is amazing. That's so great. It's not about actual physical bridges. <laughs> no, no. It's no, it's not about bridges. It's bridging between math and all these other things. But art was always a huge part of it. And th those were the sessions I always picked out, right? So it was awesome. Check it out. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, do you guys think you'll be back in Wichita to maybe like check out how students come and take field trips and do different workshops like you guys do at other cities or no? Uh, we would love to understand how teachers are working with it. I think it's a really unique opportunity since this is a college campus and a teaching environment. And I'm sure there's a lot of schools nearby with younger kids as well. So that was definitely something that we would love to um, understand, you know, maybe there's a lot of synergy between, you know, the different types of curriculums that can be developed because obviously, you know, something that um, can be explained to a third grader is a lot different than something that would be explained to um, like a master's student or something like that, right? But um, the kind of fundamental building blocks of this artwork, I think, really can be understood by all in um, I'd love to see the development of understanding that comes with kids that learned about it at a young age and then see how that develops and you know, maybe it affects the course of their lives or something like that too. Thank you. Um, so this is going to be kind of a three-part just ex explanation. Um, 
99 was my first Burning Man, and it was at Burning Man. And I went four times, and 2005 was my last. And I became very involved in the maker spaces and, and the various forms of functional participative sharing art in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, I've become very watchful of it throughout the country. And the maker spaces have grown amazingly. And the informative part of this is that in Wichita, in my estimation, we have the best maker space in all of, all of America right now. Uh, it's 24 seven, every day, all time access. There's two metal shops. There's two wood shops. There is a ceramic shop and kiln. Are you recruiting us? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm also informing the, the, the entirety of the room here because the, make, the maker space isn't really known here, but it's, it is the best one. And I, I've been coming to Wichita since 2016 on and off and decided to move here into 2019. And uh, it's just on a scale that's, it's just, it boggles me. And I've been to Burning Man five, you know, four times. And um, we want you to come and help us there, oh, okay? Yeah. And there is a very strong growing arts cultures here in Wichita that are based off of the participative principles of Burning Man. Mm -hmm. And there's some amazing artists and groups that are forming their own warehouse spaces. And uh, we have here in Wichita, there are two in the United States there are only two forms of this certain specific type of speaker setup from the UK. It's called the Element 5. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the best technical sound systems. And this group called Tribal Roots, they started with Burning Man in 2016. The same, same year you guys doing your you know, first public speaking, uh, per, first public uh, installation. And uh, they travel to the various regionals for Burning Man and the various festivals. And they really want to start connecting up and out with various artistic groups. And this will help them elevate up. And I really want to, I want to be a facilitator of intermingling the maker space here because it is so profound and, and uh, helpful for everyone. And it's extremely affordable. It's $25 for a month. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And such, such good, there's three CNC machines, wood, plasma cutter, and a full three-dimensional CNC machine that's available for anybody as long as they get trained on it. The staff there is amazing. So I just want to ask you guys to consider that in the future. I'm going to be reaching out and making some connections with them and you. I feel this is really strong. This can go with some really powerful, wonderful places. Amazing. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I can't emphasize how much that maker movement really created what we are today. And we just wouldn't be in the same place at all had we not had training and metal work and had we not had training in CAD and design and um, just gave us the idea that it was really possible to create um, using these kind of advanced manufacturing tools that previously had only been in like factories. I mean, it also taught us how to weld, right? Our first welding lessons were at Tech Shop and the first brackets for one of our installations, we, we went and welded uh, at Tech Shop. So, yeah, it's uh, invaluable, and I, I hope uh, people continue to develop them. You've done an amazingly thorough job in describing the calculations that go into your creativity. Uh, the one thing I'm very interested in, though, <clears throat> are what I might call the architectural elements that you have to pay attention to. I'm talking about the weight of the material, the stress with wind and temperature variations, et cetera, et cetera. Could you, could you address that element? I would, I would love to. Um, so geometry itself, when it's a fully contained sphere, incorporates something called tensegrity. And it's the same sort of strength that comes out of an egg, where every corner and vertex is pulling equally, equally on each other. And that creates an extremely strong form. Right? Um, so much more stronger than if you were to cut it in half and just have half of it. So a lot of our shapes are only shells. We do not require inner structures to, to prevent them from collapsing because they're fully contained. And you'll notice n really none of our artworks are sliced or cut off. They're always the full object. 
as though gravity or the ground is not part of them, right? Almost like they fell from space or they just landed there or they could be rolled away. And this full shape gives so much rigidity and strength that a lot of those concerns just become irrelevant because the pure form of the geometry. Um, and just to highlight our boy, Buckminster Fuller, who developed that concept of tensegrity, and that's why they were able to create um, the giant um, uh, spheres that went into like the World's Fair and um, to create uh, the like fly-eye dome and to create the pavilions that he became really known for um, is because the force of the of the sculpture is really spread evenly throughout each one of the points. The, when we do work with engineers, the main thing, the only really concern for our pieces is anchoring them to the ground. So they don't fly away, they don't fly which away. I've heard could be a problem here. <laughs> um, it's never about the artwork collapsing. Um, or, or, and you've seen some of the pictures. We've had people climbing on them, even the small pieces. We, we didn't know this when we first started. And we once like three people got up and started jumping and dancing on our sculpture and we got so nervous, but nothing was inflecting or, or budging. Um, it just speaks to the, the powers of geometry and, and how um, they hold themselves together so well. I'm making the assumption in my naivete that you ship the pieces that are partially formed I'm assuming that you are always there for the construction, for the final uh, positioning of the pieces, or uh, is that not correct? We are. We've been, except for this is the first time where we did a test build. We weren't able to come here to do the final build, so we sent some of our staff. Um, typically, we like to be there for the, the, the final put together. Yes, we ship everything flat. In this case, in this case we ship 12 components. But we've done installations where we've shipped all 72 and built it piece by piece by piece um, if it requires it. And then what implication does that have for the structure in Turkey uh, since you don't have oh. security? Oh, oh yeah, actually, yeah. That the, one also we didn't, we're not able to go to assemble. Um, we the, shipped instructions. Yeah. So <laughs> we shipped about 30 pages. And we had did a test build as well and documented it all. And they had a professional art installation team. So that actually is the other instance where we, we haven't gone um, to install. <laughs> but we love, yeah. we love building, you know, building the shapes. It's, it's kind of a cathartic experience for us. Um, it also helps us build a team and a community. The thing that we've learned doing this is it's not just about us or the artwork. It's about the people that come to help you build it. Right, especially at Burning Man, the people, friends who supported us, they supported us physically through helping us do the builds, emotionally, financially, they were all involved. We had our opening for the installation in San Francisco and 200 people showed up, friends, family, who were all felt like they were you know, invested in this mission, this project. You know, we don't put our names on it because it's kind of bigger than us. We could see it being taken by a new group of artists under the same mission, right, to, to continue the work that we do. All right. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions for this evening. Uh, we want to thank you both so much for coming to share with us this evening. And thank you all so much for coming to listen. I hope you all have a great evening. Great.